Hi, welcome to the State of Working America podcast, where we seek to elevate workers' voices to make sure they're heard in the economic policy debate in Washington and beyond. I'm Pedro da Costa, your host today, and I'm here with my colleague Rami Jackson. And I can't think of a more appropriate guest for a podcast such as this. Uh, then Stephen Greenhouse, who's the former labor reporter at the New York Times for a long time and is now an author. And most recently, he's written a book called Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past, Present, and Future of American Labor. And given that this podcast is sponsored by the Economic Policy Institute, as I was reading it, I, I picked up a lot, a lot of the, it was kind of a humanization of a lot of the research teams that EPI has been uh, working on since its inception in the 1980s. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us, Steve. Great to be here, Pedro and Rami. Uh, so I wanted to start really by just jumping into the book, which you, you know, we held an event at EPI. It was a really nice chat. Uh, we had a nice discussion about it. And you really tried to uh, give a sense of the arch of uh, labor activism history in the United States. And I think to tell some of the uh, underappreciated stories of just how significant the gains were for, for workers in the past century or so. So one of the main reasons I wrote the book is that I, fee I think far too many Americans know far too little about labor unions and what they've accomplished over the decades. Uh, you know, many people think that you know, God handed down the 40-hour work week. No, it was decades of struggle by workers and the unions that brought us the 40-hour work week. Uh, I have a chapter about you know an amazing strike by 20,000 garment, female garment workers in New York in 1909 and how they were out for two months in the dead of winter. And, and they were fighting not for a 40-hour work week, they were fighting for a 52-hour work week down from 56 hours. Whoa. And people also often forget that you know thanks to unions, uh, we have employer-sponsored health coverage, we have paid vacations, we have paid retirement plans. And there's a lot of truth to the bumper sticker Unions, the folks who brought you the weekend. I remember that bumper sticker uh, in my in my old uh, newsroom at Reuters. Uh, one of our union activists had it uh, prominently on his desk. Can you tell us some of the more fascinating historical, uh, you know, incidents sure. that you came across in your in your research? Sure, so, 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 as I said, uh, I, I feel Americans know far too little about unions and what they've accomplished, and I feel it's especially true about young Americans. So I really tried to write an accessible book with some of the highlights of, and most you know, compelling, most arresting uh, highlights of, of, of labor history. So I wrote about this famous 1909 strike of female garment workers, and I wrote about the horrendous Triangle Fire, which really helped spur unions um, to you know, fight for better safety conditions in that huge tragedy, 146 uh, workers, most of them women, most of them immigrant, immigrants, died in 1911. So one uh, surprise uh, I encountered in, 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 in researching the book is that the great Frances Perkins, who was FDR's labor secretary and the first woman ever to serve in an American cabinet, she was having After tea. After whom the building itself is named. Yes. She was having tea with friends on Washington Square on a Saturday afternoon in 1911. And she, they, hear, they hear fire whistles and screams. And Frances Perkins runs over and sees women and, and men jumping from the windows of the Triangle Fire to their deaths. And she, that, she said that was the day the New Deal was created. And, and she became head of these commissions to study ways on how to improve safety for workers. She became Governor Al Smith's industrial commissioner, then, then the uh, industrial uh, commissioner for someone named Governor Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and that catapulted her <laughs> to become labor secretary. And she was an amazing, amazing woman uh, you know, it was really she was in ways the mother of Social Security and the 40 hour week and the minimum wage and child labor laws. So that's that's one amazing story. Another amazing story is about the great Walter Ruther, who, to my mind, is one of the very best labor leaders of the 20th century. And, you know, he grew up in, in West Virginia. His father was a socialist, a uh, leader of the of the brewery union. And uh, and, and Ruther moved to Detroit. And, and got a job at a horrible automobile factory where people were getting injured all the time. And, and Ruther, having imbibed his father's militancy and activism, became a union leader. He's a phenomenally you know, 
bright, charismatic union leader. And by the, you know, in his 30s, he became head of the national, the national UA, United Auto Workers. And he and his two brothers were involved in the Flint sit-down strike in 1936-37 that uh, really led finally to the unionization of what was then the nation's largest company, General Motors. That created a huge wave of unionization. And again, it showed that you know, people going on strike and sacrificing, and again, that was a two-month strike in the dead of winter in, in, in Flint, Michigan, which is much colder than, than, than Manhattan. And uh, so that led to, uh, you know, 400,000, 500,000 people being unionized in the auto industry. And then uh, when Ruth, after Ruth became president of the UAW, he really clinched these amazing contracts with General Motors, a five-year contract that greatly raised wages and, and provided the best uh, health coverage and pensions for any work, any unionized workers in America. And that became a humongous model that hundreds of other companies copied. And that union contract really became a key element in building America's middle class. So when people say, who built the middle class? It was in many, way, in many ways America's labor unions that, that built the middle class. Could you talk about the convergence of the a lot another historical detail a lot of people don't know, and that I actually came across fairly too late and later in my life than I would have rather come across the fact is that is how much the civil rights movement, despite some early racism in in union activism, how much the labor uh, movement intersected with civil rights activism, and how at the front lines uh, of of labor activism people like Martin Luther King were, and in fact. His death was actually related to a strike. Can you talk a little mm-hmm, bit sure. about that? Thanks for asking. Great question. So uh, the labor movement, unfortunately, has a very mixed record on race. And in the early, in the first half of the 20th century, you know, there was huge racism against you know, Asian American workers, huge racism against many African American workers. At the same time, some unions were enlightened. Uh, the CIO unions were all for uh, allowing in people no matter what, you know, what the race. And... and uh, a. Philip Randolph, again, one of the labor greats and someone who doesn't gets far too little attention in American history, he was the head of the Sleeping Car, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters Union. And, and that was a union largely of African Americans, and, and, and they became like a big part of the African American middle class. They played a huge role in the civil rights struggles of the South. You know, someone, you know, the head of the sleeping car porters in in Alabama was the person who kind of chose Rosa Parks to, he kind of mentored her about how to how to commit civil disobedience. They were the ones who bailed her out after she was arrested. Oh, wow. And then, you know, and, and A. Philip Randolph, what, you know, people think that Martin Luther King Jr. was the person who organized the famous March, March on Washington 1963. It was really A. Philip Randolph. So the union, you know, unions... Some unions are really ambivalent about. And it was King. a march for jobs and Ma- justice. March for jobs and justice, know. and some unions, unfortunately, were very ambivalent about Dr. King and thought he was pushing too too hard. But on the other hand, you know, there are some courageous union leaders, you know, uh, Randolph and Ruther, who really led the way in supporting the civil rights movement. And when the rubber hit the road, and LBJ was pushing to, Linda Baines Johnson was pushing to enact civil rights laws. The un- unions played a very big role in helping that overcome opposition from, from Southern senators and get that enacted. So I have a chapter about the Memphis sanitation workers strike, which was a great victory for, for labor and civil rights, but at a tremendous cost, the death of, of Dr. King. And, uh, and, and it started with the death of two workers. Yeah, right? yeah. so um, I profile a, a sanitation worker in Memphis, Elmer Nickelberry, who you know came back from serving in the Korean War and couldn't find a job in Memphis. And, and, you know, he was tired of everyone calling him boy. And I write that, I quote him saying, I was treated better, I was treated with more respect in Korea than I was back home in, in, in Tennessee. And he gets a job as a sanitation worker, and they're treated like dirt. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, you know, talk about legacy of slavery. It's just all the whites are bosses, you know, the whites are bosses, the, you know, blacks are, are the the tub toters who carry the garbage and there aren't even shower, you know, they work in 90, 95 degrees. They come back all sweaty with maggots all over them from carrying garbage and there aren't even showers in the garages and the, and the workers are paid terribly. You know, I, 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 Elmer Nickelberry told me he had worked there 14 years and he was making only a nickel more than the federal minimum wage, which would translate to only like $12 an hour after working 14 years lugging garbage. So one day, uh, 
in the afternoon, very rainy day, two workers get, you know, to escape the rain, crawl into the back of their garbage truck, you know, where there's, where there's the compactor to, to escape the rain. And suddenly the compactor starts up and crushes them to death. And the workers were outraged. And they had told the city for, for years, you know, that trucks are obsolete, they're dangerous, they malfunction, and the city had ignored their pleas. So finally, 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 the workers, you know, got you know, uh, we're feeling really beaten down, got very worked up, and they went on strike, the 1,300 workers. And day after day after day, they walked through the streets of Memphis carrying these iconic signs, I am a man. And sadly, the mayor of Memphis was like a trillion percent ever against ever recognizing a union or bargaining with a union. So the strike was dragging on. Some uh, great African-American um, Ministers got very involved. They said, we need to escalate this. And we need to turn this into a national fight. We need to invite the great Martin Luther King Jr. to help uh, raise its profile. And Dr. King came in, gave some astoundingly moving speeches. Uh, you know, he talked about how uh, it's great that we have won the right to sit at a lunch counter. But if you can't afford to pay for the lunch, you know, what good are those civil rights we've won? And, and Dr. King was amazing. And he was in Memphis to help organize a huge march, and, and a few days before the march, he was killed. And finally, 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 the city council realized, we have to settle this thing. The mayor still refused to deal with, with the union, but the city council, uh, pushed by Lyndon Johnson, said, we have to get this damn thing settled. It's a disgrace to the nation. So finally, finally, the um, strike was settled, and I quote Elmer, Elmer Nickelberry saying, it was terrible when Dr. King died. I cried terribly. He even you know, hid under his bed. He was just so overwhelmed by it. But he said, you know, we finally got showers. We finally got the ability for, you know, black workers to be promoted. We finally got health coverage. And finally, they started calling us a man, a sanitation man. That's incredible. I mean, it's just... Powerful. It's a truly really powerful story. Um, I don't even know where to, where to go from there, but the... the where, where I do want to go from there is is to the current state of the labor movement and and where we are today, uh, and I'm I'm just wondering, there does seem to be a revival in in labor activity and, and organization and and enthusiasm, and I'm wondering what pockets of activism excite you the most or you know make you hopeful about the future, whether it's teachers, the fight for fifteen, or what. Uh, so let me, let me, let me answer with a, with a funny or not so funny story. So I turned in the manuscript of this book February 19th, on Monday morning, February 19th, 2018. And I was feeling pretty down about labor. Not much, there wasn't that much organizing going on. The only thing exciting was the fight for 15, which had gotten, you know, six, seven states to enact uh, laws for, you know, $15 minimum wage, which was very exciting, but there wasn't that much else going on. So it's kind of a quiet, quiescent period for labor. Three days later, February 22nd, 2018, there's this humongous explosion in West Virginia where tens of thousands of teachers walk out and I say, holy cow. And, and you know, it was like labor. Did you really say cow? Yes. Uh, so it's like labor was in ways reborn, you know, Phoenix-like, that all of a sudden, you know, labor seemed seriously quiet and the teachers in West Virginia were just tired of being stepped on year after year. They saw, you know, West Virginia is very much a red state, and it was pay for teachers was 48th in the nation. And, and the governor, the richest man in West Virginia, Jim Justice, a billionaire, had just announced, hey, I'm going to be really generous to you. I'm going to give you a 1% raise a year for the next five years. And meanwhile, uh, the Republican legislature kept giving tax breaks to the rich and tax breaks to corporation, and basically froze the rest of the budget, froze the education budget. And, and as a result, uh, the state healthcare agency was not was forcing the teachers to pay more and more and more and more each year towards their premiums so whatever minuscule raises they got were eaten up by increased healthcare premiums and the teachers basically said enough of that and and you know through this you know through facebook the, you know th this facebook page went from like 10 workers to 100 workers to like 20,000 30,000 workers very quickly and and this mass movement formed and one of the most interesting things about the West Virginia strike and why it happened there is they said, we have this legacy of militancy, of, of mine strikes, of the Battle of Blair Mountain, and that we're not going to 
you know, we don't let people step on us. My daddy always told me, you got to, you know, stand up for yourself. And so there was this amazing strike, and, and the, soon the baton was passed to, to Oklahoma and was passed to Arizona, and then there's the LA teacher strike, and most recently the Chicago teacher strike. So, you know, there's a big difference from February 2018 when I originally turned in my book, when it seemed fairly quiet for labor, there's been a real resurgence of strikes and activism. And, and we've seen you know, the General Motors strike just ended a few days ago. There was the big stop and shop strike, a success in, in New England uh, in April. There was a very successful Marriott strike by the Unite Here in eight cities. So, like, labor is percolating again in, in, in ways it has in years. I mean, in 2018 was the biggest year of strikes in, in 32 years since 1986. And I think what's happening is workers, you know, have seen – you know, the stock market doing well, corporations doing well, the 1% doing well, and they feel they're only getting a little bitty bit of, of wage increases. And they say, this isn't fair. That's, this is not how the system's supposed to work. I think they've grown increasingly frustrated and fed up and emboldened. And, when, and, and you know, when the unemployment rate is so low, I think people are more willing to take a risk. And I think also there's a Trump effect that people are just pissed off you know, they, they see the Black Lives Matter movement, they see the Fight for Our Lives movement, they see the climate justice movement, they see the Me Too women's movement, and, and people are just taking to the streets like never before. And, and, and I think that has also encouraged unions. And people ask me, what do I think about the future of unions? And I say, I just saw the statistic saying that one in five high school students has marched in the streets over the past year in either a climate justice strike or, or, or a... Um, uh, or you know, or movement against you know for, for for gun control against guns and so like there's there's more activism now in labor and other ways than there has been in years and partly and perversely that's been fueled by Donald Trump. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for sharing that with us. Because seriously, like I love seeing this like resurgence of labor. But I have to ask you, Steve, uh, what do you think has been holding back unions? Has it been anti-union policy, or have unions just been ineffective like advocates? So I so in my book I explain the rise of unions and what enabled them to rise and you know workers courage workers willing to you know you know to sacrifice to engage in strikes um, the work you know unions ability to rally many types of people then I I uh, describe the arc the downward arc of unions and and why they declined and part of it is globalization which has wiped out you know you know. Uh, basically, 40% of our helped wipe out 40% of our factory jobs. We've gone from 19 and a half million factory jobs in 1979 to just tw around 12 and a half million now, and and that's partly globalization, that's partly technology. So I think that's a big thing. I think um, the Republican Party and business have gotten much much tougher toward towards uh, unions. You know, I have this line in the book that many people have picked up which says that in no other industrial nation do corporations fight so hard to beat back, indeed, quash labor unions. And I had been the economics correspondent for the New York Times in Europe for five years based in Paris. And I, you know, I, I wrote stories in Germany and Austria and Italy and Spain and France and Sweden and, and, and the UK. And you know, corporations there, maybe they don't love unions, but they see unions as legitimate institutions that represent the interest of workers and that you know, we the corporations have to deal with unions to help build more productive, more profitable corporations. Here, I, in my sense, is many, perhaps most corporations see unions as as the enemy, and mm. they want to like annihilate them. They want to, you know, gut them, wipe them out. And I think that's by far the main reason that unions have grown weaker in the United States. But as you say, Rami, part of it is that you know some unions haven't done nearly enough to organize workers. Some haven't done nearly enough to inspire workers. But I imagine some um, union leaders can say, you know, I could spend, you know, $300,000 of my union locals' money trying to organize these 500 workers. You know, we could get, you know, hire three organizers to have them work for six months, and it's going to cost us a lot of money. But because of the massive corporate uh, anti-union resistance, our chances of winning might only be 48%. So union leaders can make a rational decision that yeah, as much as we'd like to try to unionize people, it might not be a wise use of our resources. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a big reason that if we have laws that make it easier to unionize, that would change the equation uh, that would help encourage more unions <coughs> to unionize. The problem is, in the private sector now, only 6.4% 
of workers are in unions. That's down from 35% at its peak in the 1950s. So unions are so weakened, their treasuries are so attenuated, that even if they want to do a huge amount of unionizing, they don't have the resources needed to organize the millions and millions of workers who might want to unionize. So, you know, and, and very encouraging note for unions right now, two encouraging notes for unions. So the latest Gallup poll finds that 64% um, of Americans say they approve of unions, that the highest approval rating among people in, in your age group, 18 to 34, with a 67% approval rating. And second, there's a recent uh, study by folks at MIT finding that you know 50% of non-union workers say they would vote to join a union today if they could. Oh, fascinating. So, so you have 50% saying, one in two saying they want to join a union, but in the private sector, only one in 16 in a union. And what's getting in the way? overwhelmingly corporate opposition. Now that stat is really important, I think, and it's really opened my eyes. I have to say, as a, as a young union activist journalist, I was kind of frustrated with the older leadership of the Guild because you thought, oh, you know, you're really operating in a different environment. We need to be more creative and kind of more youthful about our strategies. And, and I think there's, there's something to that and about our messaging. You know, there was a lot of there was weird messaging, for instance, like we had, we went and walked outside and said, keep our jobs in the USA. And like half of the workers there were like not actually American. It was kind of you know, very strange union stuff. Uh, but at the same time, not working at EPI, I've come to appreciate just how deep the attacks are, just as you mentioned, just the level of, of beatback that exists. There, there's a study done for EPI uh, by Kate Brunton Brenner Cornell. Uh, she's done a series of studies saying that like 60% of employers threaten workers that they'll close operations if they unionize. Like something like 40%, I forget the exact number, say we're going to cut wages and benefits if you unionize. 34% fire pro union workers during unionization drives. I mean, it's really... And, people, and those workers have uh, no recourse. Yeah, when, I, when I was writing recourse. for the New York Times, I tell my editors, you know, the, the playing field is really stacked against, tilted against workers in unionization. They'd say, that's not true. American law is so fair. And I'd say, no, it's really hugely stacked in favor of, of corporations, making it very hard to unionize. You asked me before, Pedro, you know, where do I see bright spots now for labor? Certainly with the teachers. The teachers are waking up. You know, they're not really taking gunk anymore from anybody and 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 they're tired of the years of austerity with tax cuts for the rich and corporations while schools are starved and class sizes increase and and kids have to deal with obsolete obsolete books and not enough librarians and, and nurses and we've seen big fights about that in chicago and la and st paul and other places so the teachers are kind of a bright spot uh the fight for 15 i think you know when it began you know almost exactly Seven years ago, November 2012, you know, it was you know 200 workers going on strike uh, in New York City, maybe 20 restaurants. I was the first journalist to write about it, and I thought, this is quaint. This isn't going to go very far, and I'm glad to say I was wrong. I mean, we've you know seven states have enacted uh, uh, $15 minimum wage, and, and by some estimates, thanks to the fight for 15, 24 million workers have had their pay increased, and that's and that's a huge deal. Other bright spots are in my field. Even in fields involving many educated workers, adjunct professors, they're unionizing mm -hmm. probably faster than any other group in society right now because you have all these people with PhDs, they're teaching courses for like $2,000, $3,000 each. Maybe they get, that translates to $15 to $20 a course. It's crazy. Graduate students uh, are, are rapidly unionizing. I, I think I just saw a news release saying that the graduate students at, at Harvard are threatening to go on strike in early December because Harvard refuses to reach a contract with them. And my my field, you know, journalism, there's been a huge wave of unionization in in journalism, uh, both in legacy media like uh, the Chicago Tribune and the LA Times. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal have long been unionized, but not the LA Times and Chicago Tribune, which generally were by far the nation's two most prominently anti-union newspapers. And then in digital media, there's been an amazing amount of unionization in, in Vox and Vice and Salon and Slate and Huffington Post and you name it. And I think what happened is you get these you know, smart, educated people. They expect to make a decent living in journalism. You know, they're working in, 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 in Manhattan where, you know, or Washington where rents are pretty high and, and they're getting paid thirty four, thirty five thousand dollars $35,000 a year. Uh, and your rent might be fifteen hundred, two thousand a month, and like try to live on that. So they said, you know, 
we are well educated, we do important work, we're working 50, 60 hours a week, and we should be paid more than 35,000. So, uh, the Occupy generation. The Occupy, and, mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the, the, the rapidity with which we've seen unionization across digital media is just astonishing. So, Steve, uh, with these elections coming up, like, you know, with the presidency, like, how do you feel, I'm sorry, not these elections, the election for the presidency, like, how do you feel about these various labor agendas that you're seeing amongst these Democratic candidates? Like, I read an article that said that, like, you know, this is the f first time in a while that Democrats are really taking, like, labor seriously and, like, not just using workers as props and, like, showing up to strikes and just, like, snapping a nice photo. This is, like, where people are actually getting down and, like, actually writing some real policy. So, like, what's really exciting to you? Great question. So let, let me put things in context. So uh, I was covered labor for the New York Times for 19 years, and every even-numbered year, the Times would send me to Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan to write about what labor was doing in the campaign to attract, you know, unionized gun owners uh, and other things, and what were the candidates doing to attract labor. And you know, I'm sorry to say, Hillary Clinton did not do nearly. You mean enough. there were? You mean the New York Times was in search of the of the of the, of the elusive Trump voter before uh, Trump existed? Is that what you're I, telling me? I wrote doing? a ton about that for the New York Times. And okay. It pisses me off to no end when people say you know journalists didn't write about that. I wrote about it. Maybe uh, you know maybe other folks did not write enough about that. But uh, Hillary Clinton did not campaign. Did not work hard enough to attract union voters and blue-collar voters. I'd say the same about John Kerry. I'd say the same about Al Gore. Hmm. Obama knew it was important to go after that constituency, and he did. And um, so I think the candidates realized that Hillary made a bad mistake by overlooking blue-collar America, not focusing enough on blue-collar Americans. And and so with you know a dozen or two dozen candidates in you know running, I think you know there are several reasons why they focus so much on labor. And yes, they focus far more on labor than than any time in my memory. And and they put out some very smart platforms. And I, I believe they've done that first because they see the system is really rigged against workers. I mean, wages have gone up very, very, very little, even though unemployment is the lowest it's been in 50 years. And we are the only industrialized nation, as explained in my book, that doesn't guarantee paid parental leave, paid maternity leave to every every worker. We're the only industrialized nation that doesn't uh, guarantee paid vacation to every worker. We in South Korea are the only industrialized nation that don't guarantee paid sick days to every worker. We are the only industrialized nation that doesn't guarantee health coverage to every worker. So I think the candidates see that things are broken for workers, so they want to do something about that and seriously in their hearts, and they also want to woo workers. And I think they also see that, hey, why did we lose in... 2016, because we lost these former union strongholds, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and they realized that the most surefire way to win in 2020, 2024, 2028 is win back those three states and strengthen unions in those states. And, and in my book, I have a whole political discussion saying, yes, we know about Scott Walker seeking to gut unions in Wisconsin, and, and, and that really hurt unions. But people don't realize that as a result of what Walker did, unions in Wisconsin lost 44% of their members. They've lost 177,000 members in the past decade. And Donald Trump won uh, Wisconsin by 22,700. Michigan, uh, the Republicans there passed a right to work law. They passed several other anti-union laws. Union membership in Wisconsin has fallen by like 120,000. Sorry, in Michigan, it's fallen by 120,000 in the past decade. Donald Trump won Michigan by 10,700 votes. Uh, there's a study by some professors at Boston University in Columbia that found that when a state enacts a right to work, an anti-union fee right to work law, um, the percentage of Democratic voters, the Democratic base turnout falls by 3.5 percent. Really? Trump won Michigan by 0 0.2 percent. Trump won Wisconsin by 0 0.8 percent. Both of them recently enacted uh, right to work laws. So, so it's the uh, ultimate GOP twofer. You get to be mm -hmm. pro-corporate and and pro voter suppression. Yes, yes, one yes, yes. And That's you amazing. help and you help hold down. You help fight big government. And you help Beautiful. hold down taxes, and you help you know make Medicaid worse and food stamps worse. It's like everything that they dream of. That's so, about as elegant so, as a macro. So, so, just, uh, so Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, you know, Beto before he dropped out, uh, Cory Booker, Biden, 
Um, and Pete Buttigieg have very good labor platforms. It's like they're very elaborate and like they put real thought in. Now, some people are saying, oh, maybe this is just window dressing, but it's important that they've sat down and they've had really smart people sit down and formulate these labor platforms. And I rececommend that people read them. The, the one that Pete Buttigieg did is just a terrific read. I, whoever he huh. had do this, it's a great write, it's, it's great read, it's a great way to understand what's wrong with, with uh, workplace, you know, with what's with, the, with what's wrong with the economy for American workers. Hmm. So I want to ask you lastly about one issue uh, that's election related, but also labor related, which is health care. We were talking a little bit about it before, uh, before we went on the air. And uh, as you know, progressive Democrats like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are, are campaigning on Medicare for all. Uh, there's some union resistance to Medicare for all because, after all, many unions have negotiated sort of platinum-plated plans, as they call them, uh, that they don't want to give up. That's even better than the Cadillac plans they have. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I'm just wondering, how do you see the uh, the healthcare debate? Because it's such a unique, another unique thing about the U.S. versus other industrialized countries. We're the only place where employment is the health care is tied to employment so how do you see the labor issue connecting to health care in the electoral cycle and in the context of med the medicare for all debate so you're right Pedro. there is a split within labor some you know uh progressive unions really support the idea of medicare for all they think it's a tragedy that uh, you know we're the only industrialized nation where uh not where every citizen is not guaranteed health coverage. And, and as a result, many people die, many people go bankrupt for not being able to afford health coverage. So um, some of them support Medicare for all. Others worry, hey, if we adopt Medicare for all as a nation, you know, whatever the, the uh, general plan that's developed is not going to be nearly as good as the Cadillac plans that many unions have. And they worry that this will hurt their members. And I think they also, I think some union leaders also think that a big incentive for people to join unions is to get good health, good union health plans. And if you provide everyone with health coverage uh, as a matter of right, it might take away one incentive, excuse me, one incentive for people to unionize. Mm. I, so this is being fought out. And, um, you know, I think that you know Medicare for all is an important issue, but I worry that it's dominating too much of the discussion and mm. is turning off a lot of people. And I think the Democrats have other issues that are far more winning issues, like a fair attack system, like doing something serious about global warming when the Republicans are doing nothing about global warming. You know, I say even something like passing laws to require, you know, to guarantee paid sick days, paid vacation, paid parental leave. The Democrats should really trumpet that, I, I argue, and the Republicans will, you know, run to the corner and, and do businesses bidding and say, we can't do that. We can't have paid sick days like every other country. We can't have paid parental leave like every other country because business doesn't want it. I think there are other issues that will appeal to Americans even more than Medicare for All. And Medicare for All is unfortunately... You know, if we had to start from scratch, of course, we'd want universal health coverage with a, you know, a Medicare for all system, I think. But it's very hard to go from where we are now to there. And I think a lot of unions you know, realize that. So some unions say, yes, let's try to make this huge leap to Medicare for all. Others say it's going to be too difficult. It's going to turn off too many voters and it's going to hurt some of our members. So maybe that's not the best issue for the Democrats to focus on. Thank you so much. Uh, the book is Beaten Down, Worked Up, The Past, Present, and Future of American Labor. The author is Stephen Greenhouse. He was our guest today on the State of Working America podcast. Thank you so much, Steve, for joining us. Great to be here. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Rami, for helping me hold down the fort. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you for letting me come on in, Pedro. Of course, my pleasure. You've been listening to the State of Working America podcast. You can download us on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, or you can go to epi.org slash podcasts. Thank you so much for listening.